Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the yeah. webinar. Um, we're just going to give it a couple more minutes here to make sure everybody who uh, wants to join has been able to. Okay, so I think we'll get started with today's webinar. My name is Fiona Lewis, and um, I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar hosted by AMAC in recognition of Rare Disease Day. The Aplastic Anemia Myelodysplasia Association of Canada is a leading funder into bone marrow failure diseases. And our organization supports patients and caregivers across the country who are living with aplastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndrome and paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. I'm the patient support liaison for BC and Alberta and um, I invite you to visit our website to find out more about our patient support meetings across Canada. So I'm very pleased uh, to introduce our speaker for today's webinar regarding the stem program at Canadian Blood Services. Dr. Heidi Elmrazan is currently the director of Canadian Blood Services Stem Cell Program and is responsible for overseeing the National Public Cord Blood Bank and Stem Cell Registry and has been with CDS for eight years. Dr. Elmrazan obtained her PhD in Medical Sciences from the University of Alberta with a concentration in cryobiology. She then went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Following her fellowship, she became an instructor at Harvard Medical School and an assistant in bioengineering in the Department of Surgery and Obstetrics and Gynecology. Her area of research was focused on fertility preservation and developing novel biopreservation techniques for stem cells and reproductive cells. Her main areas of expertise and experience include biopreservation, stem cell banking, and translational medicine. She has published two book chapters on stem cell preservation, as well as over 30 journal papers. She has hundreds of contributed and invited presentations at various national and international meetings. So we are going to have some time for questions at the end of her presentation. I ask that you um, type any questions you have into the chat window on the right side of your screen. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll read out those uh, questions for Dr. Elmrazen to answer. So with that, I will turn it over to her to begin the webinar. Great. Thank you very much. Can you hear me OK? I can, yes. Perfect. OK. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation to come speak with you today. So um, my intent of my talk today is to give an overview of Canadian Blood Services Stem Cell Program. At Canadian Blood Services, you might have noticed that recently, as of, um, it was back in 2018, we actually went through a brand change for the organization. And really, our, our brand was more than just a logo change. It was really an emphasis that that everything, what we do matters, and our vision really is to help every patient to match every need to serve every Canadian, and we are Canada's biological lifeline. I think one of the most exciting parts for me with the new um, rebranding at Canadian Blood Services was people often thought of us as just a blood organization, and it's really nice because in our new branding, it's blood for life, plasma for life, stem cells for life, and organs and tissues for life, so I think it's really helped highlight um, the stem cell program in general. So just a bit of an overview of what encompasses the stem cell program at Canadian Blood Services. So the program is really designed to pro provide high quality stem cell products to meet patient needs across Canada and around the world. 
And currently stem cells are used to treat over 80 diseases and disorders. The most common things being blood cancers, but also problems with the immune system um, or, uh, or um, bone marrow failure. We do this by providing uh, services in HLA typing and donor and recipient matching. We run, an, um, we provide adult stem cell donations as well as frozen cord blood units, and we run two autologous programs. So I always say our stem cell program really consists of four main pieces. Autologous stem cell manufacturing, which I'll talk a little bit about, our adult stem cell registry, which probably this group is most familiar with, our public cord blood bank, and then our cord blood for research program. Um, so when we're talking about stem cells in at the stem cell program at Canadian Blood Services, we're really talking about hematopoietic or blood forming stem cells. And these are the stem cells that can divide and become any one of the main three types of cells found in the blood, either red cells for carrying oxygen, white cells which are important obviously in the immune system or platelets which help in blood clotting. People always think when they hear stem cells, they often ask me um, if it's controversial and if we're dealing with embryonic stem cells and I always reiterate that it's not. These are specifically stem cells that are designed uh, to become blood cells. So how are stem cells collected? There's really three ways that you can collect stem cells from two different sources. So either your first sort is from an adult through a bone marrow um, collection. And so this happens after a stem cell match is found between a donor and a recipient. I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But with a bone marrow collection, basically uh, stem cells are collected from the iliac crest of the bone from the bone marrow under general anesthesia of a patient. Uh, the second way is you can collect through adult peripheral blood stem cells, and again, this is after a stem cell match is found between a donor and recipient. It's very much like a blood donation, except you're sitting on an apheresis stem cell collection machine for a little bit longer. A collection can take about four to six hours, and we really only separate out the stem cells and all the other blood components are returned back to, uh, to the donor. The third way is with cord blood, and um, this is actually collected from the umbilical cord and placenta of a healthy baby, um, and this is done before a match is found. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about all of those uh, in, a, in a little bit. So why do we even need stem cells? And I sort of mentioned this already, but right now there's over 80 diseases and disorders uh, that stem cells can be used to treat, including things like leukemia, lymphoma, aplastic anemia, immune dysfunctions, and genetic disorders. Um, as was mentioned in my bio, I've been with Canadian Blood Services now for eight years, and when I first started, we actually it used to say that there was over 50 diseases and disorders that stem cells could be used to treat. So now this list has grown, and with time, we keep seeing more indications uh, for stem cells to actually be used in transplantation. So there's really two types of stem cell transplants. There's an autologous stem cell transplant where you're basically your own donor. So um, when a patient is sick and they might have something like multiple myeloma, the stem cells are removed, a patient would undergo chemotherapy, and then this, their same cells are given back to that person at a later date. With an allogeneic stem cell transplant, the stem cells are connected from, collected from a matching either a related or an unrelated donor um, and transplanted back to a patient. So that's sort of the difference between those two methods of transplant. And at Canadian Blood Services, we're actually involved in both transplantation methods. So with our autologous transplants, we do that through our stem cell manufacturing program, which I'll talk a little bit about. And with the allogeneic, um, we deal with that through our Canadian Blood Services stem cell registry and our Canadian Blood Services cord blood bank. Um, so these are some stats from 2018. So in 2018, there were 1,900 patients across Canada who received a stem cell transplant. These numbers would include Quebec. And um, of those, 1,200 patients received an autologous transplant. So they received their own stem cells back. In the allogeneic transplant world, that means it was either a related or an unrelated transplant. So you're getting somebody else's cells. There were about 700 transplants that took place across Canada in 2018. So this graph just actually, this is from the CIBMTR, and this graph actually just shows some of the indications right now for stem cell transplantation. So the green bar is autologous, and the blue bar is allogeneic. So you can see the most common um, treatment um, diseases that are treated with an autologous stem cell transplant are things like 
multiple myeloma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then with an allogeneic transplant, the most common diseases would be something like um, acute myeloid leukemia or um, myeloid, uh, myelodysplastic syndrome. So, and then there's obviously other diseases like aplastic anemia that allogeneic transplants are used for as well. So in terms of what we do in the autologous stem cell manufacturing space, at Canadian Blood Services, we actually have two autologous stem cell manufacturing facilities. One's in Edmonton and one's in Ottawa. The Edmonton facility was actually established back in 1979, and it's dedicated to processing, testing, storing, and distributing stem cells for autologous um, patients to be infused at a laser date. And like I said, most common things are things like multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin's, and Hodgkin's lymphoma as well. So collections for an autologous program are performed by the hospital. They collect the cells and then they send them to our FACT, FACT stands for the Foundation for Accreditation for Cellular Therapy. They send it to us, our, our lab, our accredited lab, to actually perform the processing, storing, and testing. Um, so back in 2018-19, we did about 129 units in Edmonton that we processed and stored and we distributed 96 back for transplant. We actually received our FACT accreditation, which is really the standardized body um, um, for, for this. Um, we received it first in 2006, and we just got reaccredited back in 2018. As I mentioned, we also have a similar autologous stem cell manufacturing program in Ottawa. And the one in Ottawa was established actually in 1991. And it actually services patients in Ottawa, Sudbury, and Kingston. And it's dedicated to the same things as the Edmonton Labs, so processing, testing, storing, and distributing cells for autologous transplant. Um, and again, this lab is FACT accredited. And we perform, we perform much higher volumes in Ottawa. We do about 350 were performed in the 1819 year, and 219 of those products were distributed back to patients. And we, again, received our first FACT accreditation back in 2000. We were the first lab in Canada to receive our FACT accreditation, and we were reaccredited back in March 2017. So if you recall from my earlier slides, I said that there were about 1,900 transplants that took place in 2018, 2018 in Canada, and of those, about 1,200 were autologous. So from the autologous space, you see we did about 350 transplants. So almost a third of the autologous transplants or, um, that were done in Canada, we had a role, we at Canadian Blood Services played a role in that transplant. So, when people actually need an unrelated donor, so now we're talking about an allogeneic transplant, um, why do we need unrelated donors? And this is because obviously the patient would have a disease or a disorder where an unrelated donor is needed. And we know that hundreds of patients at any given time in Canada are in need of an unrelated donor. So if you recall from my slide when I was giving some stats about last year, I said that there were about 700 transplants that took place in Canada from either a related or an unrelated donor. So 25% of people are actually able to find a match within their own family. But for those other 75% of people who don't have a match within their own family, they're in need of an unrelated donor. And when we're looking for a donor um, here in Canada or worldwide, we have access to a worldwide registry. So on that worldwide registry, there's over 37 million adult donors, and we have access to over 777,000 publicly banked cord blood units. Um, so in terms of what goes into matching, so when we're matching a patient to a recipient, it's all matched on HLA or human leukocyte antigen markers. These are basically protein markers on both cells in the body, and it's how the immune system recognizes which cells belong and which cells don't. So we try to match the HLA of a patient to a donor. And so usually when we're matching, we're matching out of 10 key markers for an adult donor. So if somebody had a 10 out of 10 match, that would be a perfect match. Oftentimes your best match is when somebody, when the donor is of the same ethnicity of a patient. And that's why we really try to build a stem cell registry that's reflective of the unique diversity that we have in Canada. And why does ethnicity matter? And the reality is that most patients will have a donor. You'll often have it, you'll sometimes will have that case where even though we have access to over 37 million donors around the world, somebody might not have a donor at all. But the reality is that most patients might not have an optimal donor. And so when we talk about optimal donor, 
an optimal donor is a perfect 10 out of 10 match donor. And your highest probability of finding an optimal donor really depends on your ethnicity. So if you're of Caucasian or European descent, you've got a 75% chance of finding a perfectly matched donor on the worldwide registry. However, if you are um, black, your probability of actually finding a perfectly matched donor drops to 16%. And that's why it's really key and critical that we build registries that are reflective of the patient need and like I said, of the diversity that we have in Canada. Um, the reality is that few patients will have an optimally matched cord blood unit. And when we match for cord blood, we don't match out of um, 10 markers. We usually match out of six markers. So a perfectly matched cord blood unit would be six out of six. But the benefit of cord blood is you actually can get away with less strict HLA matching. And so you can get away with an imperfect match. And the reality is that most patients um, almost 100% of patients under the age of 20 will have a, a cord blood unit that matches to them. And over 80% of all patients, regardless of, um, of ethnicity, actually has a cord blood unit that matches. So that way, and I'm going to talk about cord blood in a little bit, but that's why cord blood is really critical, particularly for ethnically diverse patients. So just talk a little bit about our adult stem cell registry at Canadian Blood Services. It was established back in 1988 as the Unrelated Bone Marrow Donor Registry, and we received our accreditation from the World Marrow Donor Association. That's sort of the governing body that oversees all of the registries around the world. Uh, we received our first accreditation back in 2006, and we've now fully accredited back in 2012, and we just received our reaccreditation this year, actually. Um, back in 2007, we rebranded to be known as One Match Stem Cell Marrow Network, and that's what many of you on the phone probably know us as. But back with our um, rebranding of our Canadian Blood Services rebranding that took place in 2018, our name has also for the registry rebranded to Canadian Blood Services Stem Cell Registry. And with the registry, we target um, young people between the ages of 17 and 35, but primarily male, because male donors tend to, we can get more cells from male donors, um, so we tend to recruit males, and we also target our recruitment to non-Caucasian males, and I'll talk about this on my next slide, about the ethnicity of the registry. So you can either join the registry online, where we'll send you a buckle swab kit by mail, you can do it at, um, at Canadian Blood Services Blood Donor Clinic, um, or you could do it in an event where they have swabbing events, where these buckle swab kits are completed in person. So right now we have about 450,000 people on our registry here in Canada, and so we make part of that 37 million pool worldwide. So about 450,000 of those volunteer donors um, are here in Canada. And we have an online portable, portal called the Stem Cell National System Solution, or FCNSS, that our 12 transplant, Canadian transplant centers um, in Canada actually connect directly to and have direct access to see the profiles of our Canadian donors. So here's the breakdown of the ethnicity of our adult registry. You can see that the ethnicity is primarily Caucasian. So 67% of our registry is Caucasian and 31% is non-Caucasian. And we've actually made quite a, bit, uh, quite a lot of strides over the last five years in diversifying the registry. The percent Caucasian was actually much higher in the past. And so we've done some to close that gap. But you can see where the challenges are, where our registry still is primarily Caucasian. So just to share some numbers from our 2018-19 fiscal year, at Canadian Blood Services, our registry actually does all the searching and matching when an unrelated donor is needed in Canada for all the provinces outside of Quebec. And we actually performed uh, about 10,053 searches, new searches, for Canadian patients. 402 patients received an unrelated stem cell transplant here in Canada, and they would have either received product from a Canadian donor or an international donor, but we would have facilitated all aspects of those transplants. So if you recall, when I said that there were about 700 allogeneic transplants that took place in 2018, you can sort of see what portion then were related donors and what portion were unrelated. So these would all be unrelated stem cell transplants. 
Um, 116 Canadian donors made a donation, and so you can see 38 of those were had gone to a Canadian patient, and the rest had actually gone to a patient internationally. So this is a bit unique because we play in an international space. So when our patients here in Canada are are sick and need a stem cell transplant, we search our Canadian and international registries. And similarly, when um, patients in other countries um, are sick, their physicians search international their national registries as well as our registries so a lot of our products actually um, our donors do serve international patients as well and this is not really surprising just because of the unique diversity that we do have here in Canada a lot of the donors that are selected tend to be ethnically diverse as well um, so we recognized that there was some challenge with, with the diversity of our stem cell registry and with that we decided to set up an initiative here in Canada um, many, many years ago, actually, to build a national public inventory of high-quality, ethnically diverse stem cells from cord blood to increase transplant opportunities in Canada and around the world. So why cord blood? And really, one of the benefits of cord blood is there's really no risk to the baby or the mother because all aspects of collection happen after the delivery of a healthy baby. So after the baby is born, we go in and we collect the stem cells that remain in the umbilical cord and placenta. And these are the same kind of stem cells that you would find in the bone marrow of a donor. And so they're collected in advance. We can freeze it, test it, and type it. And then it's used at a later date. So because all the collection aspects are done beforehand, this is one of the benefits of cord blood over an adult donor because the time to get the cells to a patient happens a lot quicker because they're already frozen and we can get it to the transplant center quite quickly, as opposed to with an adult donor, somebody might have signed up to the registry five years ago and then we have to track down the donor and they have to have their infectious disease markers tested. Um, so there's a time saving for sure with cord blood. And really, cord blood um, is easier to match for people, particularly for ethnically diverse and pediatric patients. There's a lower instance of something called graft versus host disease. And usually one cord blood unit is enough for a child or a small adult. And many adults would sometimes need two cord blood units just because it's there's of the number of cells in those uh, units. The cost of a cord blood unit is about $40,000. So when we, when we use a cord blood unit from an international uh, cord blood bank, that's how much the Canadian transplant centers are paying um, to, to use that unit. So obviously one of the benefits of us having a bank here in Canada is that there's a huge cost savings on that. Um, so the cord blood bank, the business case be ba began back in 2007. We obtained funding in 2011 and really when I started at Canadian Blood Service I was brought on as, uh, to be the director of the cord blood bank. So I started with CBS in uh, 2011 and then uh, just after the time we obtained funding. We actually officially began operations of the Cord Blood Bank back in September 2013, and we received our American Association of Blood Banking accreditation in uh, 2015, and our labs are also FACT accredited, and we received our FACT accreditation in February of 2019. So with our Cord Blood Bank, collections are performed at designated hospitals. So we collect in Ottawa, Brampton, Edmonton, and Vancouver. And all aspects of the processing and manufacturing and storage are completed at our either our Edmonton or our Ottawa facilities. The majority of activities happen in Ottawa, but we also do have a facility in Edmonton. And we collect at, the, at designated collection sites, which I'll share on the next slide, um, Monday to Friday, 16 hours a day. And uh, it's an ex-utero collection model, which means that all the units are collected by designated Canadian Blood Services staff who are in the hospitals after the delivery of the baby. Uh, so this just shows uh, where we collect cord blood. In Ottawa, we collect at the Ottawa Hospital. In Brampton, we're at the William Osler Health System. In Edmonton, we're at the Lois Hole Hospital for Women. And in uh, Vancouver, we're at the BC uh, Women's Hospital and Health Centre. The thing is, though, these cells, even though we bank them, they're made available to any patient who needs them, regardless of where they live. Uh, so we've actually collected about 34,000, uh, from 34,000 moms since we began the bank, and we've got almost 4,000 units frozen available for transplant right now that's searchable by our transplant physicians. 
We've already distributed 25 units. Um, about half of those have gone to Canadian patients and the other half have gone internationally. And we receive excellent collaboration and support from the collection hospitals that we work in. And this little cute baby on the left um, is an example of all the moms who donate, they would get a little baby hat uh, for their baby and um, when they complete the second stage of their consent form, they receive that little tiny hero bib as well. So it's really um, making awareness of the program. And so what happens is the mom get, becomes aware of the, how does the mom sign up and so she can go on while she's um, during her pregnancy and either go online and register to become a cord blood donor she can, or she can bring her um, paperwork into her physician. So we recruit moms through doctor's offices um, or online, like I said, and all they have to do is fill out a permission to collect form. And then all aspects of collection happen at the hospital. And you can sort of see here, this is what a collection sort of in that middle picture looks like. Um, basically, the placenta is placed in that steel bowl, the umbilical cord comes down, and we just needle into the vein and collect all the cord blood. And on the right there is an example of a bag of cord blood that's been collected from a mom. This cord blood unit would then come back to our manufacturing facility and it gets processed where we separate out the, the plasma and the red cells and we just keep the buffy coat and the buffy coat is the, the layer in which the stem cells reside and that little picture on the right there is after we've done all the processing, basically we end up with a 25 um, milliliters of product that gets frozen and cryopreserved. And so it's, it's always fascinating to me that this little tiny cassette the size of uh, this person's hand can actually be used to save somebody's life. And, and one of the benefits of cord blood right now, too, is it's currently um, getting discarded as medical waste. So we're actually finding a way to, to make use of this project and help patients who need a stem cell transplant. Uh, we then freeze those cord blood units in something called a controlled rate freezer. And um, it's that big machine that you see there on the right. The picture on the, the left there is what actually, if you were looking into the freezer, each one of those cassettes fits into one of those slots in the freezer, and it gets, it's an automated, it's a controlled rate freezing process that brings the cells basically from room temperature down to minus 196 degrees Celsius. It's stored in liquid nitrogen, um, and it's all barcode labeled so we can track exactly where in those slots uh, this, the cord blood unit sits. And the freezer, as you can see on the picture on the right, it has that black thing as a big robotic arm that will basically take the cell, the, the cassette down, put it in a slot in the freezer, and start the controlled rate freezing process. Um, I always get asked how long you can keep cord blood frozen for, and the answer is actually indefinitely. I always say it's not like putting a bag of peas in your freezer. You're not going to get freezer burn with these. And there's many examples of cord blood units that have been stored for over 20 years and then been used to, for transplant with, with no problem. And so one of the benefits of, of setting up our cord blood bank is we actually purposely chose hospitals and cities to collect in that had a high ethnic diversity. And so all of the partner hospitals had at least 4,000 births a year and at least 20% ethnic diversity. So you can actually see that the composition of our cord blood bank is about 61% non-Caucasian and 39% Caucasian. And one of the great things is that we actually have a huge, over a quarter of the units that we have banked come from multi-ethnic donors. So you can sort of see why uh, cord blood is used really to help those patients who are hard to match and ethnically diverse. So what happens with searching and matching? So like I said, you can either match out of six or out of 10. And so uh, I think everybody knows you get half of your uh, genetics from your mother and half from the father. And so you can see the pay on that picture A, you can see what a patient, the one stream, the black circles would be from the mom, let's say, and the blue would be from the dad, and a perfectly matched donor would have the same uh, HLA matching to you. When you have a five out of six or a nine out of 10 match, there's one mismatch usually between the patient and the donor. So when we do this searching, we look at our, our database here in Canada, and then we search an international database through the World Marrow Donor, Asso donor Association with Bone Marrow Donor Worldwide, and the transplant physicians then can see all the patient data and search, and we get a list then of all the potential donors and cord blood units around the world that matches to a patient. So what 
really the Canadian patient search process. So if somebody needs a stem cell transplant, the Canadian Transplant Centre will register that patient's information with Canadian Blood Services. And then at Canadian Blood Services, we do a search within our own Canadian registry, as well as with the World Marrow Donor Association, so we can see those 37 million adult donors and those almost 800,000 publicly banked cord blood units. We then send a search report back to the Canadian Transplant Centres and they start to have a query then of what uh, they can look at international registries or our national registries to pick donors or cord blood units and then they can select which ones they want to work up. So what happens when a Canadian Transplant Centre identifies somebody either here in Canada or elsewhere around the world um, as a donor, we go through something known as verification typing. So um, if, if a donor is thought to be a high probability to be a match, the transplant center will request verification typing. So let's say the donor is here in Canada, they send it to one of our case managers at Canadian Blood Services who then contacts the donor by phone, performs a health screening questionnaire, and reviews with them what's entailed in the donation pro uh, process. Um, so donors are el have to be eligible and willing to proceed, and they ha then they have to schedule an appointment to have a blood sample drawn because we have to do their um, infectious disease marker testing to make sure they're cleared and safe to donate their stem cells. Um, so these blood sample collection kits are actually all put together by, by our staff at, in the stem cell program. So they're assembled and verified by transplant service coordinators, and then they're sent directly to collection locations. So these kits would contain instructions, the requisition paperwork, the samples to be drawn, all the packing and shipping material, the way bills, custom invoices if applicable, because um, sometimes we might be sending kits internationally as well. Um, so some of the challenges you can see from uh, that could arise with a Canadian donor is that, like I mentioned earlier, somebody might have joined the registry five, ten years ago, and so it can be hard sometimes to track down those donors because they've moved, they've changed their names, they haven't kept their information up to date with us. And oftentimes we will go to extreme lengths to even track down a donor. We have a contract with the RCMP, which actually we use them at times to help locate a donor. Um, and another challenge is that a donor might be medically deferred or become unavailable due to personal reasons. Oftentimes our donors are young, so they're, they're college students or university students, so they might be asked to donate during a time when they're in school and it's not convenient for them. So these are some of the challenges that we work around. I think one of the most staggering stats that I people are often surprised to hear is that 50% of the time that we call somebody and ask them to donate, they back down. And so this is a number that we're trying to change. We want to make sure that when people join the registry, they're aware of what's entailed in the donation process. And sometimes people join because they hear of a stem cell drive for a particular patient. And so they might be interested in donating stem cells to little Billy, but when somebody else in Canada, unknown to them or around the world, needs their stem cells, they back out. So we're trying to find we're, we're working on tactics to sort of increase that rate of availability of our Canadian donors because it adds time to the search process as well. Um, the worst part, though, is when a, a donor backs out, obviously, at the very last minute when a patient's already undergone gone chemotherapy, for example, and that could have, obviously, devastating um, effects on a patient. So we always try to avoid those type of situations and we're always communicating with the donor about what's entailed. But these are some of the challenges that we do face. Um, so when a donor is selected, this is called workup. So the, the most suitable donor is selected by a Canadian or international transplant center and then they proceed to workup, which is the donation process. So the case managers at Canadian Blood Services work up all the requests for all Canadian donors and our cord blood unit shipments, um, as well as international donors and recipients as well. So the transplant service coordinator co coordinates the workup requests for the international donors. Um, and in some very urgent cases, the transplant center may request a simultaneous VT and workup at the same time, just because there might be time constraints where the patient might be sick and they wanna, really sick and they wanna start the process quicker. Uh, so then the collection actually takes place. So let's say Canadian donor is identified. Um, well, regardless if it's Canadian or international, it's the same process. 
the patient starts chemotherapy or radiation to destroy all the disease cell, and then the donor makes a donation. And so we can either collect it, like I said, through those two methods that I talked about on my earlier slides, either through a bone marrow collection. So this is a surgical procedure that takes place in a hospital under general anesthesia, um, or by peripheral blood stem cell connection, uh, collection. So with this, the donor is given something called GCSF. And what GCSF is, is it, it's basically a medication that pushes out your stem cells from your bone marrow into your bloodstream. So your stem cells are now circulating in your bloodstream. And then, like I said, this is very similar to a blood donation, um, except it takes a little bit longer. And then that's how we collect the stem cells through peripheral blood. So for a product from an adult donor, it's basically hand delivered to the transplant center. So at Canadian Blood Services, we, we coordinate all aspects of, of the transport of that product. So we contact the airports and the couriers. The courier arrives the day before the collection. Uh, they pick up the product the same day of the collection or the next day from the hospital. And then they basically deliver it via it's that little credo cube um, within 24 to 48 hours of a collection. And basically, this, this it's carried, handheld with them on a flight, for example, if it's going international um, around the world. And similarly with cord blood units, so the cord blood units basically um, are placed in something called a, cryo, uh, a dry shipper. So these dry shippers hold liquid nitrogen temperatures uh, for up to seven days. And so the, that little cassette that I showed you in those pictures would we be put into the dry shipper and then be shipped from, if it was a Canadian cord blood unit, from one of our two manufacturing facilities, either in Ottawa or Edmonton, and then it can go anywhere around the world. So whether it's an adult donor or a cord blood unit, the transplant basically is the same. Um, the transplant is very much like a blood transfusion, and the patient uh, is prepped for the transplant procedure about two weeks in advance and remains in the ICU. The cord blood stem cells uh, or the adult donor product arrives. It's warmed up at room temperature at the bedside, and it takes about 20 minutes for a frozen cord blood unit to do this. But if it's a fresh donor product, this would be done right away. And then it's basically transfused into the patient, and the patient is monitored for engraftment by taking small blood samples daily. And engraftment uh, for a cord blood unit can take anywhere between 15 to 30 days, and it's quicker for an adult donor. Um, the last part, which I'll just spend a couple of minutes touching base on, is research, because I've talked about sort of the main elements of our program, but we also have a, a research program. So we have a core blood for research program, and really the objective of this program was to make available any core blood units that were not bankable or couldn't be used for transplants. We wanted to make sure we made them available for research. And people are often surprised to hear that we only bank about 25% of what we collect of cord blood. And the reason is that the cord blood samples need to have enough stem cells to be useful and, uh, for a transplant. And many of the units that we collect don't, but we can use them for research. So we established a research program back in um, August of 2014. And we've basically provide fresh and frozen cord blood units to academic, government, or private sector. Um, so researchers just submit their application via email. Um, it gets reviewed by myself. It goes through REB for ethics approval. We set up a material transfer agreement. And then the researchers can then submit orders to actually obtain cord blood units. So like I said, the researchers can either get a fresh cord blood unit or a frozen cord blood unit. The prices vary whether between whether it's fresh or frozen, whether they're in private industry or academic. Um, so the price range is anywhere from $100 to $3,000, depending on where what they're asking for. So we've provided hundreds, hundreds of cord blood units to scientists across Canada through this research program. We've actually received 24 applications for projects, and 17 of them are currently approved. So if you actually go onto our website, you can see a list of all the, the projects that are approved for research. And if you click on it, you can read a little lay summary of what research uh, these cells are used for. And many of these cord blood projects are used to help um, research in stem cell transplantation or basic science research or cell therapy or regenerative medicine. So there's a number of different applications um, which these units are used for. 
so currently we're supporting one project in british columbia two in alberta and 14 in ontario and like i said uh to obtain core blood products we have a website and an email address and uh, researchers can just go directly on there to obtain units from us um, we also have recently started an, an initiative. We're actually providing cord blood units to support clinical trials in Canada. Uh, so a clinical trial would be uh, used for something that's not considered standard of care therapy or an application that's not standard of care therapy. So we now have a method uh, to make these units available to physicians uh, who are running trials across Canada. Um, and really, this is consistent with our Canadian Blood Services vision to help every patient match every need and, and serve every Canadian. And so uh, that's why we set up this program as well. And that's the end of uh, my presentation. So I always want to thank all the moms who donate their baby's cord blood units and obviously all the adult stem cell donors who generously give a piece of themselves to help uh, save a life and to the dedicated staff on my team uh, who do this great work. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, well, thanks, Heidi, for that really um, thorough overview. It's uh, interesting to hear about the benefits of cord blood versus stem cells. Um, uh, some new information there for me, for sure. Also good to hear that it's not always bad news if the RCMP come knocking on your door. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I invite anybody listening who has a question to type it into the uh, window on the right of your screen. Um, in the meantime, Heidi, one question I had, or two really, um, is can people donate more than once? Um, and also, how do people feel right after they've donated? And um, so sometimes somebody might be, I think we have a maximum of, of twice that somebody can donate. And sometimes a donor might be asked to give to a patient that they've already donated to after a certain number of uh, period of time has passed. Usually with um, a peripheral blood donation, it, the patient really, there's little impact on a donor. With a bone marrow um collection, I think there's often a myth that it's scary or painful, and people often liken the feeling afterwards to falling on the ice, on ice. If you slipped and fell, you might feel a little bit sore, um, but this usually goes away within a few days. Um, but I think the long-term feeling that most of the donors feel are obviously this feeling of just being elated to be able to help save somebody's life. And I have some video. I have some patient and donor videos that I was planning to share, but I couldn't figure out how to add a media link to this. But I'm happy to send those to your team as well. Yeah, that would be great. We could uh, post them on the website along with this recording. Thanks. Sure. Um, and is it so? Is it true then as well that um, people cannot donate uh, cord blood if they're going to give birth in any other hospital than the ones you listed? Yeah, so right now you have to be delivering at one of our designated collection hospitals. Uh, cord blood banking is quite expensive, and so we, we had to be quite strategic with where we partnered and where we went. But I think the important thing to, to note is these cells are made available to anybody who needs them, regardless of where you live. But right now our program only runs at those four hospitals in Canada. Okay, thank you. And um, I was also wondering for um, stem cells, what's the lifespan of those once they're donated and how, how quickly do they have to be transported before they're not viable anymore? Yeah, so usually you would want to do that as quickly as possible. So the, the courier picks them up within usually the same day as the collection, maximum the next day, and then we've coordinated all the flight times to be as quick as possible to get to the donor center. It's usually about 72 hours maximum that you would want to have, but that's usually the time frame that we're dealing with. Obviously, with any of these cells, sort of the, the fresher, the better. Um, but, you know, we work really closely with couriers and flights and the other registries to try to get the product to the patient as quickly as possible. Wow, it's just amazing to me all the coordination that goes on to make this happen. And, yeah, it's incredible. And the difference it makes to people who receive them, I'm sure. 
Absolutely. And I think sometimes people don't often see the back end of that piece of things, right? Like there's hundreds of communications that go back and forth between a transplant center, a registry, the donor, a patient. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an orchestra of events that happen to, to uh, have a transplant take place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, incredible. Uh, well, I don't see any other questions coming in at this time. Um, no. So with that, I just want to thank you again, um, Dr. Almwazan, for um, taking the time to give us this information. And um, we'll be posting it on our website as well so other people can view it. Um, but thank I really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay. You too. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.